So, yesterday I spoke about transference neurosis, and I talked about the classical psychoanalytic idea that at least for full-scale psychoanalysis, as opposed to uh, psychoanalytic psychotherapy, um, the procedure, the couch, the frequency of appointments, um, the relative silence of the analyst, uh, neutrality, non-self-disclosure, um, these are all uh, designed to facilitate the emergence of a transference neurosis. Um, uh, I went on to uh, consider that part one, the development of the transference neurosis, and then I went on to speak about part two, the analysis and uh, essential dismantling or deconstruction of the transference neurosis. Uh, as this irrational um, phenomenon driven by uh, unmet childhood needs or childhood trauma, driven by a repetition compulsion. So we create a situation in which it emerges and once it has emerged we go to work, we analyze it, um, it functions, this transference functions as a resistance and we seek to analyze this resistance and dismantle it and help the person get over this. And I was critical of the fact that this second part of the task, not just evoking it but then dismantling it, um, is sometimes downplayed a little uh, by people who are very enthusiastic about working in the transference and maybe at times lose sight of the fact that what we ought to mean by working in the transference is not just evoking it and letting it be but uh, seeing it as the irrational thing that it is and helping the patient fight his or her way out of it. Um, okay. Um, but I was thinking afterwards, that's a pretty good description of mainstream psychoanalysis, but do I myself actually work this way? And uh, I think in fact I do not. Um, uh, it, I, I reminded myself of that earlier video lecture I gave on the still face, in which I was quite critical of psychoanalysts, psychiatrists, psychologists who somehow think that in order to practice these professions we have to learn how to develop this poker face, this non-self-revealing, neutral, still face. And I was kind of incredulous that in this helping profession um, we have tended to think that we have to develop this blank neutrality um, when in fact uh, a significant degree of warmth and caring and concern are in my view actual uh, essentials of the therapeutic process. So uh, in terms of part one, allowing the transference neurosis to develop by being, as I said, a bit enigmatic, not responding, remaining silent, taking care not to be self-disclosing, constituting something of an enigma for the patient. That certainly 
does provoke the emergence of a transference neurosis. But do I do that in my own work? Not really very much. Uh, I'm quite talkative. As you can see from my uh, YouTube channel, I can't stop talking. Uh, colleagues are critical of me for this. Um, more orthodox uh, analysts are scandalized by the fact that I have a website which reveals a good deal about me, all my publications, other information about me on the website. And then, of course, I have this YouTube channel, which uh, says a great deal about me. Um, so I am not maintaining uh, the still face at all. Um, I tend to be quite communicative. Um, I don't um, impose a whole lot of silence in the work that I do. When patients ask me something, I tend to respond. When they want to know what I think, I generally tell them what I think. Uh, I don't seek to be mysterious or obscure. Um, I try to clarify. Uh, I, I try to communicate exactly um, what it is that I think clearly. Um, so, uh, I hate being enigmatic. I hate people who feel a need to be enigmatic. Um, one of the things I hate about Jacques Lacan is his enigmatic way of communicating, his enigmatic writing, his obscurantism. Uh, it certainly evokes transferences. People become fanatical converts uh, and disciples of Lacan, precisely because he is enigmatic. Uh, I see this as a form of anal sadism, keeping people in the dark, hoodwinking them. Uh, I, I don't respect this. Certainly I don't respect it in a Jacques Lacan. Uh, I also don't respect it much as it's practiced by mainstream, silent, enigmatic uh, psychoanalysts. My attitude is patients have problems, sometimes serious problems, and they come to us for help, and they hire me, and I, I am their ally in trying to help them figure out what the hell's going on. Uh, what are they doing? Why are they doing it? Why is this repetition happening? Look, it's starting to happen here. Right now, I will point out. You're starting to do it to me now. Uh, I say this quickly. I don't wait for it to develop into a full-blown transference neurosis. It's a resistance. It's a repetition. I want the patient to see this. I want them to understand this. I try to point it out clearly. I'm not banning it. I'm not saying go away. I, I'm saying, look what's happening. Let's understand what's happening. See how what's happening happened with your boss? See how it happened with your brother? And now it's happening here? Um, the erotic transference. Um, uh, here's a woman who... Uh, hasn't been able to find a man, she wants to marry, she wants to have children, the biological clock is ticking, she comes into treatment and she starts falling in love with me. I mean, well, first of all, I'm old enough to be her grandfather. What's she doing falling in love with a man who is unavailable, who she can never have? How irrational is that? And why is she doing this irrational thing? 
uh, how, how with the biological clock ticking, how much, how much of her life does she want to invest in this impossible project of being in love with an unavailable man, instead of finding an available man and getting on with it? Well, I'm asking her this. I'm pointing this out fairly quickly. And uh, some colleagues could be critical and say, well, you're dissuading, you're, you're blocking the development of the transference neurosis. Exactly. Because spending a few years in the transference neurosis is going to harm her. By the time she ends her analysis, her childbearing bearing possibilities will be over. Um, this is something that should be headed off at the pass. Um, I, I'm inclined to go as, as far as to say that when a person spends a good length of time in some kind of erotic transference to their analyst, um, this is partially the analyst's fault uh, because he has not accurately seen it as the resistance that it is. He hasn't gone to work on it. He hasn't pointed out its irrelevance. He hasn't pointed out the harmful element of what's going on. Uh, he's allowed it to be um, instead of doing what he is supposed to be doing, which is analyzing it and deconstructing it and surpassing the resistance that it is and getting on with the job of helping the patient acquire self-knowledge and self-control and helping the patient find real gratification, not pseudo-gratification, real gratification, not illusory gratification, by going out into the world and finding love and getting on with it. So, this business of promoting the transference neurosis, indulging it, um, rather than seeing it as the resistance that it is and analyzing and dispelling it. This is a problem uh, with mainstream psychoanalysis. I, I'm not saying that all mainstream analysts excessively indulge it, but I think there is a tendency in this direction because um, analysts take pride in uh, distinguishing themselves from mere psychotherapists who offer a kind of therapy where this kind of intense, deep transference neurosis does not emerge. The analysts take pride in evoking it and, and working with it. I think they take too much pride in the development of the transference neurosis. I think they don't often see it as something preferably to be quickly overcome. Uh, I don't need and I don't want patients idealizing me. I'm not in the business of, uh, pro of, of um, promoting idolatry. Uh, why do I want patients worshipping me as their god or their guru. I'm just a guy who has some knowledge that, that they have hired to help them acquire self-knowledge and to help them get over various blocks and repetitions and addictions. Um, I don't want them to excessively play out their addiction by becoming addicted to me. I want to help them overcome being addicted, period. Um, and this requires activity. Uh, I don't respect 
the, the work of, of those passive analysts who feel they're doing their job by sitting for weeks and months and years while patients play out their transference neurosis. Okay.